In this video, we're going to discuss another technique we can use to solve systems of linear equations, particularly in situations where we have more than two variables and more than two equations. So we're going to discuss a concept called a matrix and a specific kind of matrix that we can use in order to deal with these situations um, involving systems of equations. So the specific kind of matrix we're going to talk about is called an augmented matrix. So ultimately an augmented matrix is really just a shorthand for representing a system of equations. Well, if it's an augmented matrix, a special kind of matrix, what is a matrix? Well, a matrix is an array of items. We're going to use an array of numbers. Think of it as just a grid, rows and columns. Each one of the um, items in the matrix is called an element. So if you look at the intersection of rows and columns, each row, each column intersects and you have an element at that location. So to take our system and write it as an augmented matrix, we've got a few steps. Number one, if necessary, we need to start by rewriting each equation in standard form. In other words, set it up like you would if you were going to solve your system using the addition method. Everything needs to be in standard form. So just to be sure we know what that is, remember that means you want to get both variables on the same side and you want your terms in alphabetical order. Now you're going to write the coefficients in each equation. The coefficients, so A and B, whatever those look like, in a single row of the matrix. So each individual row corresponds to one equation. And then you're going to write the constants, everything that's on the other side of the equal sign, you're going to write the constants in each equation on the far right side of the matrix. And you're going to separate the coefficients on the left and the constant on the right by a vertical line. So ultimately, when we look at any matrix, each individual row represents one equation. And because each equation is in standard form, each column represents a particular variable. So if we're in alphabetical order with x and y, the first column would be the coefficients for x. The second column would be the coefficients for y. We draw a vertical line to represent the location of the equal sign. And then the far right column represents the constants that we have in each of our equations. And then keep in mind, if we were to convert using this technique, we can also convert back. So any augmented matrix can also be converted back to the original system. All we have to do to do that is to then take the variables and reapply the variables to the specific coefficients that they match with. And again, each row, if we're going to convert, we need to know what represents what. Each row represents a specific equation. And each column represents a specific variable. And that's what we're going to use to convert back to, um, to a system. Ultimately, what we care about, why would you want to convert it to a particular form only to convert it right back? Well, we're going to do a little bit in the middle. You'll want to have your graphing calculator out. The stuff we're going to do in the middle, we're going to do in the graphing calculator. So the idea is we're going to take the system, we're going to convert it using this technique. We're going to do a little bit in the middle. That's going to then solve our system. And we convert it back to the system from the matrix form. And that's going to tell us what the solution is, what the values for x and y are that solve our system. So let's just start by doing some of these conversions. We want to convert our system to a matrix, and then we'll also talk about how we do that backwards. So remember, first thing we need is we need all of our equations in standard form. So neither of these two equations are in standard form. So we want to start by putting each of these in standard form. So for our first equation, we can do it in one step. Notice this y term needs to be moved over. So in standard form, this is going to be 2x minus 5y is equal to 5. And then our second equation, we've got a couple steps. First, we need to distribute that 3. So that's going to be 3x plus 3y is equal to 17 plus y. 
and then move that y over, combine your like terms, subtract it because it's positive. So that's gonna be three x plus two y is equal to 17. So these are gonna be the two equations we're going to work with. So let me write these out to the side. So two x minus five y is equal to five. And then three x plus two y is equal to 17. So these would be the equations we would work with if we were going to solve the system using the addition method. And what we're gonna find is that what we're gonna do with the matrix is gonna be very similar to this addition method. So now we want to write the matrix that corresponds to this particular system. So because we have two equations, there's going to be two rows in our matrix, and then we have two variables, and then the constants. So that means there's also going to be three columns. So when we write our matrix, it's going to be a two by three. So when we describe the dimensions of the matrix, it's going to be rows by columns. So it's going to be two rows by three columns. That's gonna be important once we start to put things into the calculator. We need to know how many rows, how many columns to start with, and then we can start typing in the numbers. So I'm gonna go row by row. Essentially what happens is I just drop off the variables and I'm just gonna keep the constants, including their signs. So the first row is gonna have a two and then a negative five, and then on the far right, a positive five. So two, negative five, and then positive five. And then the second row, three, two, and 17. So three, two, and 17. And in order to indicate that this is an augmented matrix specifically, something that represents a system and not just a generic two by three matrix, we're gonna put a vertical line in that represents the location of the equal sign. So I'm gonna put a vertical line right there and that tells me that these values are associated as coefficients and these values are the constants on the other side of the equal sign. So that would be what we would ultimately type into the calculator in order to solve the system. We're solving it using this form and then converting this form back to a system of equations. So this particular system, as we can see based on putting it in standard form, we could ultimately just solve this using the addition method. Maybe get the y's to match up, eliminate those, and then we go from there. Ultimately, the reason we want to use matrices is intended more so for larger systems where we have more variables. So this would be the kind of system where we might really want to use a matrix. So notice here, the first equation only has the variables x and y, but the other two equations have three variables, x, y, and z. So that means we're going to have to have columns for all three of these variables. Now these are already all three in standard form. Standard form just means put your variables on one side, put them in alphabetical order, and then your isolated constant on the other side. So we're going to write each of these in one row. So there's three equations, that means three rows, and then we have an X column, a Y column, a Z column, and a constant column, so four columns. So in this case, we have three rows and four columns. So we're gonna have a three by four matrix. So your choice, you can actually go across the row, write one equation at a time, or if you want, you could go column by column. In some ways, column by column is going to be better just because it's gonna help you space things out a little better. So let's fill in this matrix going one column at a time. So the first column is gonna be representing all of the X coefficients. So for the first equation, it's a three. For the second equation, it's a one. And then for the third equation, it's two. So our first column is gonna be three, one, and then two. The second column is gonna represent the Y coefficients. So we have a two, a negative one, and a positive one. So two, negative one, positive one. Our third column represents Z. Well, what about the first equation? It doesn't have a Z. Well, if it doesn't have a Z, we're gonna have a zero as the coefficient for Z. So we have a zero and then a three and a one. And then our constants on the other side are five, one, and four. And in order to indicate where that equal sign is, indicate that this is an augmented matrix, 
we draw the vertical line and that's going to be our augmented matrix. So let's also practice converting back. What if we have an augmented matrix in whatever form we want, whatever form we need, and we want to convert it back? So we're going to write the system of equations corresponding to the matrix that we're given. And we're just going to assume we're using the variables x, y, and if necessary, we'll use a z. So the first column represents x, the second represents y, and then for this particular one, since we have a larger system, that's going to be x, y, and z. So our first row represents our first equation in the system, and these are going to be the coefficients respectively for x and y. So our first row corresponds to the equation negative 4x plus 6y. The bar indicates where the equal sign goes, and then that's going to be equal to the constant 11. And then our second row, that's going to be negative 3x plus 9y, and that's going to be equal to 1. So that would be the system we get from this particular matrix. Now what about this one? This one is in a very specific form, and we're going to talk about this form in just a moment. So first row, notice it's 1 and then two zeros, which means we don't actually have a term for y and z. We just have a term for x and it has a coefficient of one. So if we were to interpret this row as an equation, it's just going to be x is equal to six. And then our second row, we have a one in the y column and the zeros in the x and z columns. So the only term we have is gonna be a y term. So that's gonna be y is equal to negative 10. And then for our third row, we only have a z, so 1z is equal to 4. So this system is a little bit different than this system. It's different in a couple of different ways. Number one, we have three variables and three equations rather than two variables and two equations. But even more so, look at the kinds of equations we ended up with. We ended up with three equations, each containing only one variable. So in this particular situation, notice that, that corresponding system essentially represents a final solution. If the idea is that we're taking a system and we want to solve for the individual values for each of the individual variables, well, this would be a value for the first variable, a value for the second variable, and a value for the third variable. So anytime we see a system in this form, if we were to convert it back to an actual system or take a matrix and convert it to the system, this particular form is going to correspond to a system that's been fully solved. So what we want is to take a matrix that looks like this and somehow convert it to a matrix that looks like this. Now there is an actual algebraic technique for doing this. We're going to look at how you do it in a graphing calculator though. So this particular form that converts back to a final set of solutions is what we call reduced row echelon form. So reduced row echelon form. Or we can just abbreviate this as RREF form. And we're going to see this notation in the calculator. Now the actual algebraic process we use to take a matrix and make it look like this, take something like this that doesn't have ones and zeros and get the ones and zeros, that's the goal, to get those ones and zeros. This process is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. It's very similar to the elimination addition technique you use to solve a system of equations. It basically builds off of that. You just do it without any variables. You do it using the rows in the matrix without any variables. But the technique is essentially the same. The steps are essentially the same. So if you end up taking a course called linear algebra, you'll talk about how you actually go through and get a matrix like this, how you do that by hand. For our purposes, we're just going to focus on the shortcut using the graphing calculator. So although there exists an algorithm in other words, a sequence of operations for this elimination procedure. This goal, the goal of meeting this particular form, getting this particular um, matrix form, can be more easily accomplished using a calculator. 
So that's what we're going to focus on, is how you would do this in the calculator. So ultimately, there's going to be two major things you're going to have to do in the calculator. You need to know how to type in a matrix, and then you also need to know how to reduce the matrix, how to take that matrix you've typed in and get that particular form with all the ones and zeros, that form where you can just essentially read off the solutions. So I've got the steps for you here. You can come back to this, but it's going to be easier if we have some actual numbers to look at. So let's look at an actual system and we'll go through the steps to put it into the calculator once we get to that point. So if you see the directions solve the system using Gauss-Jordan elimination, essentially that means for our purposes that you're just going to put it into the graphing calculator. So you want to convert the system to an augmented matrix and then you're going to put it into the graphing calculator and you're going to go from there. So our first system will start with something small, just two variables and two equations. So we need to get it into that augmented matrix form, which means first thing we need to do is we need to get the standard form for each of these two equations. So for the first equation, I just need to move my y term over, so add it, move it over. So x plus 2y is equal to 17. And then for my second equation, I need to distribute, I need to move a term around. So we have 3x plus 6y is equal to 47 minus y. Add your y, move it over. So 3x plus 7y is equal to 47. Okay, so these are going to be the two equations that we put into our augmented matrix. So two equations, that means two rows, and then two variables plus a constant means three columns. So I'm going to go column by column just so the spacing is a little bit better. So for our first equation we have x and then for the second we have 3x. So we have coefficients of 1 and 3. We have coefficients of 2 and 7 for our y's. We then hit that equal sign so I'm going to draw a vertical line. And then we have constants of 17 and 47. So that's going to be that final column. Okay, so we're then going to take this matrix, we're going to type it into the calculator, and the calculator has an operation to convert this to that reduced row echelon form. So the first thing we need to do is get it into the calculator. So if you look on your calculator, over on the left hand side, right above the button that looks like an X with an exponent of negative 1, Right above that in blue, it says matrix. So everything you need to work with this particular kind of form is going to be under the menu you access there. So because it's blue, we're gonna hit second, and then X to the negative one, which is really the inverse button, that will take you into the matrix menu. Now the matrix menu has three sub-menus. It has a name menu, a math menu, and an edit menu. This is kind of strange, but you're actually going to use these menus in the opposite order. You'll start with edit, then you'll use math, and then you'll use names. So names is where you find a matrix that you've already typed in. So if you type one in, your calculator is going to save it, and you can find it here on the names menu. Math, if you arrow over, math is where you're going to find all the different operations you can do on matrices. We're only going to need one of them. But again, if you take another class, Linear Algebra, you'll go a little bit more in depth with matrices and you may find some things here that you can use. So we're going to start with the next menu, the Edit menu. Edit is where you're going to type in the actual contents for a matrix. So if you've never used the matrix menu before, this is going to be blank. Now if it's not blank, I'll show you in a moment how you can clear out that menu, get rid of the stuff you've already typed. It's not as simple in this menu as just pressing the clear button. It doesn't really work that way. So you're going to highlight a clean one, whichever one you want, or you can ultimately type over one you already have if you've already used this menu, but you're going to highlight it and then you're going to press enter and that's going to take you into the location where you can type in um, everything you need for your matrix. So you'll notice the flashing cursor. I need to type in the dimensions for the matrix first and that's going to format the grid for me. So I have two rows and three columns, so my matrix is two by three. So two, and then enter, and then three, and then enter. Notice it formats it for me. 
and then it highlights the first element. Now as we enter in elements, it's going to start in the first row, it's going to go across the row, and then it's going to go down one row at a time. So it works left to right, one row at a time. So the easiest way to type things in is just to type a number, press enter, and let it take you across the row and then down to the next row. So my first element is 1, so 1, enter, and 2, enter, and 17. And then notice what I hit enter after the 17, it takes me down to the next row. But each time I press enter, it's saving that particular element that I just typed. So then 3, enter, 7, enter, and then 47, enter. And once you type in the last element, it's going to take you back up to the very top left hand corner. Now before you do anything else, you want to double check that you did in fact type in the matrix you intended to type in. Easiest mistake to make is just mistyping a number. If you mistype even one number, it completely changes the outcome of the problem. So it's worth taking a moment to double check that all of your entries are correct before you do anything else. Now once you're satisfied that your matrix looks good, you have to get out of this particular function. It's not a clear thing, so don't press clear. You're going to have to quit to get out of it. So right above mode, which is next to the second button, right above mode in blue, it says quit. So you're going to press second and then mode, and it's going to take you out of that edit menu. But it has saved the matrix you typed in in whatever entry you chose in the matrix menu. So it's now saved. It's now in your calculator. Now you're going to go back into the matrix menu. So again, second, and then the inverse button is going to take you in there. And notice whichever matrix you chose to type into, it now has the dimensions. It has that one saved that you just typed. So we've used the edit menu. Now we're going to use the math menu. This is where you're going to find the operation you're going to use to simplify, to reduce this matrix, to put it in the form you want. So you're going to scroll down until you see RREF. Here we go. Now notice there's an REF and a double REF. You want the double R. So you're going to highlight that and then you're going to press enter and it's going to put it on your home row. Now you're going to go back in one more time to your matrix menu. You need to choose the matrix that you want to apply this function to. So second, inverse button, and now you're using names. So edit, then math, and then names. Highlight the matrix you want to reduce and then press enter again. And notice it puts it in there. You close your parentheses and it's now understanding that you want to use the row reduction operation on this matrix, whichever one you chose. So then you can just press enter and it's going to reduce that matrix for you. So notice it doesn't look exactly the same as that previous matrix we saw with the ones and zeros, but it's got a similar form in terms of having ones on that diagonal and then zeros next to those ones. So you then want to write that down. So that particular matrix is going to convert to this matrix. So 1, 0, 0, 1. It doesn't draw the bar for you, but it's understood that the bar is in the same location as it previously was. So then we have 25 and negative 4. Now once we've solved this, once we've got the RREF form, we want to convert it back to an actual system so we can write our actual solution. So remember what each column represented. This was our X's, this was our Y's, so this is still X and Y. So one X and no Y's, so single X is equal to 25. And then for our second row, there's no X, but there's one Y. So our single y is equal to negative 4. So if we wanted to write this as an ordered pair, it means the solution to our system is going to be the ordered pair 25, negative 4. That is going to be our solution. And of course you can always verify that by taking those values, plugging them back into your original equations. Make sure that both equations are true after you plug those values in and that's your verification. Now this particular system, you don't technically need a matrix to solve. You could do this one doing substitution pretty easily. X is already isolated. Or you could use addition if you wanted. The next systems are a little bit larger and these would be the kind of systems where we would potentially want to use this technique. 
So this system now has three variables, three equations. These three are already in standard form, all your variables on one side, all in alphabetical order. So all we have to do is write in whatever values we want for our matrix. So I'm gonna go one column at a time. So the X column is gonna be three, one, and negative four. So three, one, negative four. My Y's are gonna be seven, two, and negative six. So seven, two, negative six. And then Z's, negative 15, negative four, positive 15. Negative 15, negative four, positive 15. Then we have our equal signs. So draw your vertical line. And then negative 12, negative three, positive 16. Okay, so that's our augmented matrix representing our system. We want to reduce this in the calculator. And let's not forget what our columns represent because once we convert back at the very end, our columns are still gonna represent the same thing in the same order. So let's clear out what we have already. So clear your home row. Now if you go back into the matrix menu, second and inverse, notice that matrix you typed is still there. Suppose you want to clear this out and you want to start fresh. You have a couple options. Technically you can type over the matrix you already have or you can get rid of it. Now if you try pressing delete, it's not going to get rid of it for you, unfortunately. You have to use another strategy to clear out this menu of anything that you've typed in. So I'm going to get out of the menu. Right above the plus sign on the right hand side near the bottom, it says MEM, which stands for memory. This is how you clear things out of the memory in your calculator. So if you press second and plus, it's gonna take you into the memory men, uh, menu. So under option two, you see the term delete. This is where you're going to delete specific things like a matrix. So arrow down, highlight that particular option and then press enter. And notice option five says matrix. This will take you into everything you could clear out of the matrix menu. So you're gonna arrow down, highlight matrix, press enter. And then whichever matrix you already typed in or if you had some pre-existing matrices, they'll all be listed here. You can um, delete just one, you can delete all of them, your choice. So you're gonna highlight the one you wanna delete. If you need to use arrows to move around, you can use those. You highlight the one you want to delete and then you're going to hit the delete button. If you clear, that's not going to work. You're going to hit the delete button and then it clears that out for you. So then you can press clear and it's going to take you back to the um, home screen. And then what happens if you go back into the matrix menu? Well, it's cleared out and it starts fresh. So again, you can write over matrices every time if you want, that's certainly an option, or you can go and you can delete each time if you want as well. So remember, edit first, then math, then names. So edit, and I'm still just gonna use matrix A, so press enter. Now this matrix we wanna type is three rows and four columns. So this is gonna be three by four, and it's gonna format it. So across the row, and then down one row at a time. So three, enter, seven, enter, negative 15, enter, negative 12, enter, and just a word of advice, be careful as you type things in. The subtraction symbol is on the right. The negative symbol is right next to the enter button. If you want to make a number negative, make sure you're using the negative symbol and not the subtraction button. You will get a syntax error if you try to use the subtraction button to make something negative. So just be aware of that. Okay, and then negative four, bottom row, negative six, positive 15, and positive 16. Okay, and again, double check, make sure all of your entries are correct. It's very easy to mistype something. Double check before you do anything else. And then once you're satisfied that your matrix is right, remember you're gonna quit to get out of it. Second and mode takes you out of that and your matrix is saved. Now go back into your matrix menu, math sub menu, go find RREF, option B, hit enter, and then go back into the menu one more time. Choose the matrix you want to reduce, in this case mine is matrix A, and then hit enter again, and it reduces it for you. And so that means our reduced matrix, notice the ones and zeros, those look familiar. I'm going to 
to write those down first. You're going to notice that form repeats. That's going to be consistent for any time we reduce a matrix. What's going to change is the numbers we have on the far right, which again, at this point, represent our solutions to our system. So column X, column Y, column Z. So X and Y and Z. And so the first row just corresponds to the value for X since we don't have a coefficient for Y or Z. So we have X is equal to negative one. And then second row, Y is equal to three. And then third row, Z is equal to two. Now notice we have three values here. So when we write our solution, it's actually going to be an ordered triple. Because our system has three values, if we were to graph these, they're still linear. They're linear because our, our variables have it, um, exponents of one. But because we have three variables, these would be lines in three-dimensional space. So any individual point in three-dimensional space needs three coordinates. So these would be the three coordinates that represent the location where these three lines happen to intersect in three-dimensional space. So that is going to be the solution to our system. Okay, let's do another one. We'll actually do two more. For the very last one, we're going to add in an additional variable. So make sure everything is in standard form first. So let's label these equations because these are not in standard form. Okay, so for equation one, we need to move our y term over. Make sure everything's in alphabetical order once you move your terms. So 2x minus 7y plus 8z is equal to negative 46. Watch your signs. Okay, for two, we need to move two terms. We need to move the y term and the z term. So subtract the y term, add the z term. So y minus 3y plus 3z is equal to negative 18. And then our third equation, we have the z. Need to move the x and y. So add the x, subtract the y. So x minus 5y plus 6z is equal to negative 34. Okay, so now we have standard form. We can write our system. Again, three rows because there's three equations and four columns because there's three variables and a constant. So our first column, two, one, one. Our second column, negative seven, negative three, negative five. Third column, eight, three, and six. Then the line for our equal signs, and then negative 46, negative 18, negative 34. Okay. So I would advise you at this moment, maybe pause the video, make sure you can type your matrix in. Make sure you can find that RREF operation. Make sure you can reduce it. And then start the video back again and double check your answer. So if you want, do that and I'm gonna work on it. And this time I'm just gonna write over the matrix we already have. So option A, if I just wanna highlight it, press enter. The dimensions are the same. It keeps all the entries there, but you can just type over them if you want. So just type your new entry, press enter, and it types over it. If you choose to do it this way in particular, double check for sure, double check that all of your entries are correct. Let me read through mine, make sure it looks good. Okay, so remember type it in and then RREF back in the matrix menu under math. And then back in one more time, highlight the matrix you wanna use. And then that reduces it for you. So our reduced matrix all those ones and zeros that we expect to see.
and then we have a zero, a two, and a negative four. Now don't be alarmed by that first row, the fact that there's a zero on the other side. It just means that x is equal to zero, which is a possible value in an ordered pair. So x is zero, y is two, and then z is gonna be negative four. And that is gonna be our ordered triple that solves this system. Okay, let's do one final example and let's add in a fourth variable. So now we have a W, so W, X, Y, and Z. Now all of these are technically already in standard form, but notice we're missing terms here and there. So we're gonna have to be really careful when we write the matrix. Now this is gonna be four equations. And because we now have four variables and a constant, it's going to be five columns. So it's gonna be even more important that we double check things as we type them into the calculator. So start with the first column, the W's. Notice the first and third equation have a W term and the second and fourth equation don't. So those are gonna be zero entries. So one, zero, negative two, and zero. So W and then X, so three, one, negative four, one, three, one, negative four, and one. We're missing a Y, missing a Y, got a Y, got a Y, so zero, zero, one, one. And then Z, 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 and then missing a Z. So negative three, negative two, positive two, and zero. Negative three, negative two, positive two, and then zero. Then vertical line, and then negative five, negative six, one, and five. So ultimately, one problem is not necessarily harder than the other, but the more variables, the more equations, we just have to be really, really careful, be very methodical as we go through and identify everything. Okay, so type in your matrix. Now here, if we type over the matrix we've already entered in, we're gonna have to expand the dimensions to a four by five. And notice it's just gonna add in zeros where we didn't have entries before, but it's gonna leave the entries we already have. So again, you're just typing over them. It's perfectly fine. You're gonna type over the entries you already had. And then of course, you'll get new entries for the new ones that were added based on that new dimension. It may seem tedious to have to enter all of this in, but I can promise you that this is a lot faster than what it would look like if you had to solve a system like this by hand much, much faster, much more efficient. Okay, of course, double check all of your entries. Make sure everything looks right. Double check your signs. Very easy to type the right absolute value, but type the wrong sign. And then once you're satisfied, of course, you can quit, go back out, go back to the matrix menu, R, R, E, F. There we go, enter, get your matrix. Remember, use the names menu. Edit is where you type one in. Names is where you find what you just typed. And then you can reduce it. Look how pretty that is. So same kind of pattern of ones and zeros, but we just have one more row, one more column. Notice where the ones and zeros are though. That's what essentially highlights um, reduce row echelon form. The fact that ones are along that main diagonal and then zeros, we have triangles of zeros, and then on the other side, we just have whatever constants solve our system. And so in this case, x, y, or excuse me, w, x, y, and z, one, two, three, and four. So we have an ordered quadruple. If we could graph lines in four dimensional space, this would be the location in four-dimensional space where these four lines intersect. So now that we know how to convert to an augmented matrix, how to use the calculator to solve our system using that matrix, how to convert it back and interpret what we're seeing, 
Now let's talk about some ways we might use matrices. Matrices are very useful because systems of equations pop up all over the place and using a matrix to solve the system will usually save us a lot of time. So systems of equations can be used to represent different real life situations where multiple variables are involved and they are constrained by one another. The value of one limits the value of the other and they have to be related in specific ways based on the limitations in the situation described. So we're going to look at a couple of applied problems. Just general idea for applied problems. Make sure you read through at least a couple times. Read the first time just to understand the situation and then go back and start looking for details. This is also a great time if you have highlighters, colored pens, something like that. It's helpful to find some way to organize the information in a meaningful way. Go through and determine what's important and what's not. And I'll give you a little bit more advice in a moment for how you actually write the system of equations because that's going to be the goal. We're going to take this situation and we're going to represent it using a system of equations. So let's go through the, um, let's go through the prompt first. So a student borrowed $20,000 to buy a truck for his business. He borrowed from his parents who charge him 2% simple interest. He borrowed from a credit union that charges 4% simple interest. And he also borrowed from a bank that charges 5% simple interest. He borrowed five times as much from his parents as from the bank. And the amount of interest he paid at the end of one year was $620. So our question is, how much principal did he borrow from each source? And just a hint, principal means just the original amount of money that was borrowed. How much did he borrow from each source? And then we have a hint. We have the formula for simple interest. So simple interest is principal times interest rate times amount of time. And here we're going to assume that the amount of time is just one year. And we know this because we're talking about the amount of interest paid at the end of one year. We know that that is $620. So the general idea is this person has borrowed some money from three different sources. Each source is charging interest in a different way. And we want to determine how much did he borrow from each of these sources based on how interest was being charged, the total amount he borrowed, and how much interest he had to pay. So we want to set up a system of equations to represent the situation. And then we're going to solve using Gauss-Jordan elimination. In other words, we're going to put it into the calculator and let the calculator do the heavy lifting for us. So first thing we need is to define our variables. What are we actually solving for? This is going to be determined by the question being asked and then of course the context of the problem. So the question here is how much principal did he borrow from each source? So we want to know he borrowed from three sources. The sources were parents and then a credit union and then a bank. We want to know how much did he borrow from each source. So ultimately we have three unknowns here. We have one unknown for each of these original amounts that he borrowed. So we're going to call those X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to let X be the amount from parents. I'll just label it as parents. I want to let Y be the amount he borrowed from the credit union. And then we'll let Z be the amount he borrowed from the bank. And if you wanted to call these P, C, and B, something like that, that's perfectly fine. Variables are just arbitrary labels, so if you want to label them a little bit more meaningfully, that's perfectly fine. Now we have to go through and we have to define all of the different relationships we know among these three variables. This is typically where it gets a little bit challenging for a lot of people. What's a good idea to look for is if you can look for things that relate to totals, those typically go towards one equation. So each total is typically associated with one equation that relates our three variables to one another. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to highlight all of these key pieces of information that may give us um, a particular equation we can write. So the first equation says a student borrowed $20,000. So he borrowed $20,000. I'm just going to highlight that part. He borrowed $20,000. So that's how much he borrowed in total. That's the total amount that he took out. Well, if each of these individual variables represents individual amounts he borrowed towards his total, 
Then if we were to add up each of the individual amounts he borrowed, those should add up to 20,000. So that's actually going to be one of the equations in our system. So I'm gonna mark that with yellow so we know where that came from. So mark it with yellow. And then the actual equation is gonna be x plus y plus z, so each of the original amounts, all of those add up to $20,000. Okay, so he borrowed from his parents at 2%, credit union at 4%, and then the bank at 5%. Well, that doesn't give us a total yet, so let's keep going. He borrowed five times as much from his parents as he did from the bank. So that gives us another way that two of our variables are related. It tells us how parents' withdrawal and bank withdrawal are the same. So let's highlight that. So. He borrowed five times as much from his parents as from the bank. So that's the next key piece of information that tells us how two of the variables are related. So I'm gonna label that equation with blue. And how would we interpret that? So the amount from the bank, or excuse me, the amount from the parents is five times as much as it is from the bank. So the amount he borrowed from his parents is five times the amount he borrowed from the bank. So that means x is equal to 5z. Now notice that equation doesn't use the variable y because we don't know anything in relation to this situation about that variable y. That's okay, we can have a system where some equations only use some variables. Ultimately though, all variables have to be incorporated at some point within the system. Well, in order to solve for three variables, the general rule is that we need three equations. So we need just a little bit more information in order to be able to solve. So what we also have been told is that the amount of interest paid, the total amount of interest paid at the end of the year was $620. So that's gonna be another total. So the amount of interest at the end of one year was $620. Well, we know how interest is calculated each time. It's gonna be principal times the interest rate times the amount of time where time is one year. Well, we need to be able to calculate the interest from each source, and we know all of that should add up to be $620 in total. Well, we know how much interest was charged from each source. So parents charged 2% simple interest the credit union charged 4% simple interest, and the bank charges 5% simple interest. So all of those individual interest charges are related to this total of $620. So if we were to calculate how much interest he owed for each of those individual loans, all of that interest should add up to be $620 in total. So let me label this one as our pink equation. Okay, so let's write out an expression for each of those individual interest calculations. So it's parents charged him 2% simple interest. Now, just a heads up, when you use a formula like this, when you use an interest rate that's a percentage, you do have to convert it to a decimal before you can use it. So rather than using 2%, we're gonna use 0.02. So the parents charged him 2% simple interest, so the amount of interest is gonna be the principal. Now that's our unknown, we don't know what that is, that's gonna be x, so it's gonna be x times our interest rate, which is 0.02, times the amount of time, which is gonna be one year. So 0.02 times x times one. So I'm gonna write that as 0.02 times x, and then times one we don't need to write. So that's gonna be the total amount of interest due to his parents, so the amount he borrowed, times that interest rate, times one year. Now it's gonna look the same for the other two, except we have a different interest rate and we're using these other two variables, but we're adding up the total amount of interest across all three loans. So 4% from the credit union, so 0.04 times Y, and then 5% from the bank, so 0.05 times Z. So each of these individual interest amounts, these are three individual amounts, add up to a total of 
$620. And now we have three equations involving our three variables and that takes all the key information we have in this problem and that puts it all into a system form. Now we want to use a matrix to solve this in order to do the heavy lifting for us. So we need to make sure everything is in standard form. So our first equation looks good. The third equation, technically we have decimals, but we're just gonna type it into the calculator so there's no sense in doing anything with those decimals. Now this second equation we do need to rearrange a little bit. Remember, each variable, all variables need to be on the same side. So I'm going to subtract that 5z and move it over. So x minus 5z. And when I subtract it, I'm just left with 0. That's okay. That just means there's going to be a 0 on the far right of the matrix. That's not a problem. So now that we have everything in standard form, we can write our matrix. So three rows and then four columns. Now if you've been going row by row by row, normally that's fine. Here I would definitely advise you write one column at a time so that your spacing is consistent. So for your first equation, we have 1x, and then the second we have 1x, and then 0 0.02. So 1, 1, and then 0 0.02. Notice how this number is a little bit longer. If you try to go one row at a time, you may find that you haven't left enough space at the very bottom. So this is going to help you to do one column at a time. Okay, then we have 1y. We don't have a y here, so that'll be a 0. So 1, 0, and then 0 0.04. 1, 0, 0 0.04. Okay, and then z, so 1z, and then negative 5, and then 0 0.05. 1, negative 5, 0 0.05. Okay, and then all of our equal signs, and then the values on the other side. You can leave the dollar signs off if you want, because we're going to put it back into context once we actually have a solution, and then we'll know to put our dollar signs since we're talking about monetary amounts. Okay, so that's going to be our matrix that we want to put into our calculator. So again, you might want to pause the video, take a moment, see if you can type this in yourself, and then do the reduction and then get your solutions from that. And of course, come back here and I'll make sure we have everything typed in. Okay, make sure you have your dimensions. So this is going to be three by four. and then enter in row, one row at a time. Oops, see, typo already. Okay, so when you make a typo, you can use your arrows to go back to it. Just type over it again, and then hit enter again, and it'll replace it. Once you have everything entered, remember quit, so second in mode, math menu, find your reduced row echelon form operation, and then choose the matrix you just typed in, and that's going to give you your final values. So if you did it on your own, double check, double check your numbers. So for the first value, we have 10,000, and then 8,000, and then 2,000. So if these are our solutions, let's put it back into context. What do each of these represent? Well, remember we have the X column, the Y column, the Z column. So that means this is the value for X, this is the value for Y, and this is the value for Z. And these were each monetary amount, so it was the amount borrowed from each individual source. So that means from his parents, he borrowed $10,000. So I'll just write our solutions up here. So from his parents, he borrowed $10,000. From the bank, he borrowed $8,000. And then, or excuse me, the credit union, $8,000. And then from the bank, he borrowed $2,000. And we
we can double check at least briefly that these make sense. He borrowed a total of 20,000, so 10,000, 8,000, and 2,000, that's 20,000. Says he borrowed five times as much from his parents as he did from the bank. Well, 2,000 times five is gonna be 10,000. And then we could also verify the interest calculations as well if we wanted. So one example where a system of equations may be used. Let's look at one final example and then we'll be done with this. Okay, an arena that hosts sporting events and concerts has three sections for three levels of seating. For a basketball game, seats in section A cost $90, seats in section B cost $65, and seats in section C cost $40. The number of seats in section C equals the number of seats in sections A and B combined. The arena holds 12,000 seats and the game is sold out. If the total revenue, in other words, total sales, from ticket sales is $655,000, determine the number of seats in each section. And again, we wanna solve this by setting up a system of equations and then using Gauss-Jordan elimination, AKA our graphing calculator. So let's start by identifying our variables. What are we attempting to solve for? Well, there isn't actually a question mark here, but it says we want to determine the number of seats in each section. We have three sections, so we want to determine the number of seats in each section. Now here, instead of calling them X, Y, and Z, let's just call them A, B, and C. Remember, variables are arbitrary labels, so if we can label them meaningfully, that's perfectly fine since we're in an applied situation. So A stands for, of course, section A, and then section B, and then section C. We want to know how many seats are there in each based on all the information we have about this situation. Now again, when we write our system, one thing to look for is totals. Individual totals will typically be associated with one equation out of the group. So what can we find so far? So we have three sections and we have individual prices per section. So the price per section is gonna have to relate to sales. Okay, first thing we know, the number of seats in section C so the number of seats in section C equals the number of seats in A and B combined. Combined meaning added together. So that represents one of the equations in our system. So the number of seats in C equals the number in A and B combined. So that means C is gonna be equal to A plus B. Okay, now we also know the arena holds 12,000 seats and the game is sold out, which means there is someone sitting in every seat. So that's gonna be another total. So the arena holds 12,000 seats. So if we take section A, section B, section C, all the seating available and combine it all together, since everything is sold out, all of that should combine together to give us 12,000. So that means A plus B plus C is equal to 12,000. Okay, and then we also have information about sales. We know combined sales for the whole thing is 655,000. Well, each individual seat per section is $90, $65, and $40. So if we were to take the price per seat and multiply it by the number of seats, that's gonna give us that portion of the total. So $90 for a seat in section A. So if we take $90 and multiply it by how many seats are in A, that'll be that portion of the total revenue. And then the price for B times B, the price for C times C. So we know the price per each type of seat and we know that the total revenue from ticket sales is 655,000. So if we take each individual subtotal, all of it should add up to 655,000. So that will give us our last equation. So $90 per seat in section A, so $90 times the number of seats in A, that's that portion of the total, plus $65 times the number of seats in section B, that's that portion of the total, plus $40 times 
times the number of seats in C. And if we take all of those subtotals for our sales, they should add up to exactly $655,000. So that is going to be our initial system. Now our last two equations are already in standard form. The first one we need to move things around. So we have a couple of options. You can technically convert a couple of ways here. Let me scoot this down, there we go. Either you could move the C over here if you want it, and this can just be zero and you just switch sides, that's one option. Or you could subtract A and subtract B and then make it zero on the other side. Same thing, it's not gonna matter which way you go. Just to make it easier to type, I'm going to move the C. So if we move C over, it has to be subtracted. So A plus B minus C, and then we'll be left with a zero where we had our C. And that's going to put it in standard form. Now unlike the last system, each one of these three equations has the variables all represented. So that means we won't have any zeros in this one. So let's set it up. So three rows, four columns, so A's, so 1, 1, and 90, 1, 1, and 90, and again, don't worry about the dollar signs, 1, 1, and 65, and then careful with your signs. We have a negative 1 and then a positive 1, and then 40. So negative 1 and then positive 1, and then 40. And all of our totals, we have 0, 12,000, and 655,000. Okay, so let's type this in. Let's reduce it. Clear out what we already have. Okay, so go into your matrix menu. Edit. We still have three rows and four columns. So across each row, so 1, 1, negative 1, and then 0, and then all 1s, and then 12,000, and then 90, 65, 40, and 655,000. Be careful, make sure you don't leave off a 0, that will make a difference. And also, just um, for the sake of mentioning it, particularly with these applied problems, what if you identified your equations in a different order? So maybe you go, you went ahead and wrote the revenue equation first because there was information about sales to start with. Does it matter if you do the equations in a different order and therefore the matrix in a different order? The answer to that is no, it does not matter. You can rearrange the rows. You could have ended up with the equations in any order. The system is still the same and the matrix is still the same as well. It's not going to change your final answer. So what matters, of course, is the coefficients that go with each equation. But if we were to rearrange the equations and therefore rearrange the rows, it does not change anything about the final answer. So just be aware of that. So now we need the RREF operation. And then we'll choose our matrix, choose the one we already typed in, and there we go. That's going to give us our final answer. So our reduced row echelon form, we see our ones and zeros, and then we have 1,000, and then 5,000, and then 6,000. So what does this represent? Well, remember, let's go back to the context of our problem. So we were looking for the number of seats in each section in this arena. We had variables A, B, and C for section A, section B, section C. And so this is going to be A, this is going to be B, and this is going to be C. So A is going to be 1,000 seats. B is going to be 5,000 seats. And then C is going to be 6,000 seats. And it's not a bad idea, of course, to write the units. Before we were talking about money, now we're talking about a number of seats. So since we're in the context of an applied problem, it is a good idea to have our units. So again, we can verify that these make sense, at least for a couple of equations. We know that we should have had a total of 12,000 seats. So 1,000 plus 5,000 plus 6,000 is 12,000. And then we also know that the number of seats in section C is the number in A and B combined. So if you take A and B, add them together, 
you get the total that is in C. So just based on those two, our answer does make sense. So that gives you just some context for how you might use a system of equations. They're very, very versatile in terms of different situations where you may use the system. If you're looking at a real situation, typically there's going to be three or more variables. So being able to manipulate these systems using matrices is going to be a very, very helpful strategy.